Number 23. Come on down. Hello, Kentucky. Georgia versus Kentucky this week. Saturday night in Athens. 7 o'clock under the lights in Sanford Stadium. A rare night game for the Georgia crowd this week. Uh, I think this will be a pretty good game. Um, a lot of talk coming out of last week. Georgia gave up a ton of rushing yards. Kentucky ran for a million yards uh, on Florida. Georgia, of course, played uh, Auburn. Kentucky and Georgia have been playing every year for a long, long time. Uh, it's been a while since the Kentucky's won this one. 2009 was the last time Kentucky beat Georgia. Um, that game was in Athens, though, if it's any consolation. Um, Stoops is, what, 0-10? What is this, his 11th year? He's 0 for however many years he's been at Kentucky. Um it's uh, uh, Kentucky is probably the team that Kirby Smart is most complimentary about every year, before the game and after, for a variety of reasons. But mainly, uh, Kirby seems to really appreciate and respect the toughness that Kentucky plays with. Kirby has said multiple times over the course of multiple years since he's been the coach at Georgia since 2016 that uh, Kentucky is the most physical game they play every single year, year in. And year out, there are more players in the ice bath or the rehab room or whatever you call it on Sunday after the Kentucky game than any other game of the year every year uh, for uh, Georgia. And uh, I don't think it's that hard to see why. I mean, Kentucky is a physical team. They've always got big lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Um, they, they will hit you. Um, they play fundamental defense um, and the, they rely on the ground game and have for a long, long time. And uh, while that has been a strength for Kentucky, um, it has sort of been their undoing against UGA. One of the problems that um, a team like Kentucky has when they face a team like Georgia, yeah, we've all heard the expression, right? Uh, football is about matchups. It's a game of matchups, which is why the transitive property never works in college football. You know, this team beats that team, that team beats that team, therefore, the first team can beat the third team. It doesn't work that way in college football because the matchups are so different from game to game, right? One of the problems that Kentucky has had over the years with uh, Georgia going back even to Mark Rick, but particularly in the Kirby Smart days, Kentucky and Georgia are basically built the same a lot of years. Um, the, the, the philosophies um, align a lot, right? Build the teams from the inside out. Good lines of scrimmage, big offensive line, big defensive line. Um, a, 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 a foundation uh, built on the running game, right? Play action pass off of that with, which for the most part for both teams actually has been with below average quarterbacks, right? That have, Both of these teams, in other words, are sort of built the same way. They're basically the same team. The difference being one of the two is infinitely more talented from a roster standpoint, top to bottom, than the other. That's not a knock on Kentucky. Um, because Kentucky has won a lot of games, uh, especially in the last five or six years. Kentucky's 5-0 and right now. They've been 5-0 and something like four of the last five years. This is nothing new. Kentucky getting off to a, heart, a hot start and winning a bunch of games early in the season is nothing new. Now, part of that, uh, which I can't really say much about this season because uh, Georgia's guilty of it too, but if you look at uh, Kentucky's non-con schedule early in the season, it doesn't exist. Um, they never play a big early non-con game. Um, so I I'm not saying that's the only reason they've been 5-0, and but it's one of the reasons they've managed to avoid an early season loss. The other reason Kentucky has managed to avoid an early season lost so many times over the last few years is because they always play Florida early in the year. And, well, they own Florida lately. They have beat Florida three in a row, and I think four out of the last six. So that has led to Kentucky getting off to some hot starts most years um, in the last four, five, six years. Like I said, I think it's, I think it's four of the last five they, started, they have started 5-0. Um, and oh. Now, they have gone on um, to lose several games each of those years, right? They've lost to Georgia in each of those years. And I think the primary reason specifically that they have a hard time with Georgia is because it's two similar teams um, that are built similarly, that operate under similar philosophies. One of these teams is just way more talented than the other, top to bottom. Now, that doesn't mean that Kentucky doesn't have a player somewhere 
that's better than the equivalent player on Georgia. And Ray Davis is a great example of this. Georgia doesn't have a running back as good as Ray Davis. They don't. Um, that's just a fact. It's a reality. We can look at recruiting rankings or anything else we want. We, we've all seen Georgia and Kentucky each play five games. Georgia doesn't have a running back uh, near as good as Ray Davis. That's just a fact. So it doesn't mean that Kentucky uh, can't have better players here or there. I think another thing that has kind of hindered Kentucky um, over the years has been their their real lack of a of a of a passing game, a, a, a considerable downfield passing game. There hasn't been very many years where Kentucky has had a serious threat at the wide receiver position and a quarterback who can get them the ball. Now they've tried a couple of different things, right? Recruiting, obviously. Lately, they've been relying on the transfer portal to try to bring in experienced uh, veteran QBs who have played other places. <clears throat> Unfortunately for Kentucky, it really hasn't worked out all that well. They brought Will Levis in down from Penn State. And while he's got all the physical tools on paper, probably looks great in a combine, throwing the ball around, looks good um, in a uniform, probably a big guy, sort of your prototypical pocket passer. Never really translated to on-field results at Kentucky. Now, yeah, Kentucky had some good seasons with him there, and he had some good games. But he never really became sort of the breakout player, I think, that Kentucky hoped he would be. Sort of the kind of player that when the run game is stifled or not working out, um, you know, can put the team on his shoulders as a quarterback and kind of throw them to a victory in the second half. It never really developed into that. He's gone off to the NFL, so they, they have tried again bringing in Devin Leary at the quarterback position. And um, I was actually high on this one. I, I liked what Devin Leary did at NC State. Now, he was hampered by injuries last year, but if you go back prior to that, he was a pretty good quarterback at NC State. And I remember talking about this in the offseason and saying, you know, I don't I don't know about pro prospects or, or NFL comparisons, you know, but I think Devin Leary is a better college quarterback than Will Levis. Um, it's hard, almost impossible, to compare – the success a quarterback has in college and then relate that to the NFL, it's just very rarely does it does it line. It's very rare that you get somebody that's really, really good in college at the quarterback position and really, really good in the NFL. It seems to be – like if you just think about some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, they're not quarterbacks that we talked a lot about in college. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to get into that. So point is, I don't think Will Levis was very good in college, but potentially he could be a good NFL player. For Devin Leary, I kind of thought it was the opposite. I was like, I don't know about his NFL uh, potential, but I like him as a college QB. He's come to Kentucky, and it hasn't really worked out at Kentucky. Um, he Kentucky has really struggled to throw the ball. Even last week, if you look at the game against Florida, where they just dominated him and blew him out for basically four quarters, Devin Leary was horrendous in that game. Um, I, I'm not a stats guy. I didn't write the numbers down, but was it something like, I don't know, what was he, like 8 of 14 for 80 yards or something like that? Just a non-existent passing game. Now, turns out they didn't need it against Florida because Ray Davis had probably the best performance any running back has had all year long. Over 200 yards in the first half, close to 300 yards total. Ended up averaging almost 10 yards per carry for the game. Was averaging almost 20 yards per carry at halftime. So they didn't need it. Um, but Devin Leary out of just has not performed um, like I think Kentucky hoped he would. Um, and like I honestly thought he would, I, I thought he would be, um, I thought he would be pretty good. And it's not that he's been terrible. Look, they're five and zero. He's not out here costing them games every week. So I'm not saying he's terrible. I don't think he's to the level where maybe Kentucky hoped he would be and where I thought he would be. And when I look at Kentucky in a matchup with Georgia, to me, that's what kind of they have been missing. Um, well, for the last 10 years, Georgia's beat them 10, 10 straight. What did beat them 12 or 13 straight, 10 under stoops though. Um, it's not that Kentucky can't run the ball on Georgia. They can, and I think they will. I think Ray Davis will get some yards. Georgia's rushing defense is clearly not, uh, this year anyway, Georgia's rushing defense is clearly not where it has been the last four or five years. Uh, that's pretty obvious through the first five weeks of the season. Georgia, I think, still has a pretty good run defense. And it's it's easy to point at the Auburn game to kind of dispute that and say, well, if the, it, you know, how can, how can you have a good run defense? You gave up 200 yards rushing to Auburn. Well, a couple of obvious differences here between Auburn and Kentucky. Again, college football is about matchups. It's not necessarily transitive property, right? Auburn running game is not Kentucky's running game. They're, they're two separate schemes. Auburn is a ton of RPO, zone read, 
quarterback sticking the ball in the running back's gut, take you know, yanking it away at the last minute, quarterback takes off around the edge. Devin Leary's not doing that. Peyton Thorne had a 70-yard run against Georgia in the first half. Uh, you know, that's what? Uh, that, that's a third of the rushing yards they had for the entire game came on that one play, which is a quarterback run. I'm willing to go out on a limb here and say that Devin Leary is not going to have any 60 or 70 yard runs. Um, I'd be surprised if he ends the game with positive rushing yards. It's, it's not putting him down. They say he's a different style quarterback than what Auburn uses, and they run a different offense. Kentucky's run game is more of a downhill running game. Like I said, it, it, it's Georgia. It, it, it's, it's let's line up with a big physical offensive line. Let's lean on the defense, and we're going to run it right at them with a big bruising running back. And they have that with Ray Davis. And they will have some success with that against Georgia. Um, I don't think Georgia's going to hold Kentucky to 60 or 70 yards rushing like we've seen Georgia defenses do to a lot of these types of teams over the last couple of years. I don't think that's going to happen. I think think Kentucky's going to have success running the ball. Georgia's run defense is not what it has been in the last few years. I also don't think they're going to have 200 yards rushing. I think what you're going to get in this game is somewhere in between. Uh, so maybe, you know, a team like Kentucky, Georgia used to sort of almost just completely shut the run game down, you know, 60, 70 total yards. So you have that as a, as an option and you have Auburn as an option where Georgia gives up 200 yards rushing. What's going to happen in the Georgia, Kentucky? I think it's going to be somewhere in between. I think Kentucky, Kentucky could get to 125, 130, 150 rushing, maybe. Um, especially if they basically just abandoned the passing game like they did last week against Florida. Now they had the luxury of doing that last week against Florida because the running game was working so well and they had a big lead the whole time. There's no need for them to pass the ball. I don't expect that to be the case against uh, Georgia. I do think Georgia will move the ball on Kentucky and score. Um, I think Kentucky will score too. This, is, this isn't this is a thing. You know, Georgia's not winning this game 31 to nothing, uh, you know, or, or 38 to 10 or whatever. Like Georgia's been beating a lot of SEC teams over the last couple of years. It's not going to happen here. Georgia's a 14 and a half point favorite. Georgia has not covered a spread all year. In five games, they're 0-4 and 1. They hit the spread exactly on the number against Ball State, which was 42. They won that game 45 to 3. So that was a push. They didn't beat the spread. They didn't lose against the spread, just a push. But the other four games, they failed to cover the spread. South Carolina, they were almost a four touchdown favorite. They won by 10. Auburn this past week, they were uh what were they against Auburn? A 20 point favorite or something? It was something ridiculous. Uh, and of course, only one by seven. Back at home, that's a big deal uh, here, Um, playing at home versus playing on the road. Um, Of course, most teams are going to play better at home than they do on the road. Uh, Georgia hasn't lost in Athens in a long, long time. Georgia's won 22 straight games overall. Kentucky will be 23. Um, But but the the home winning streak goes back even further than that. We haven't lost a game at home since 2019. Um, so I do think Georgia will win this game against Kentucky. I don't think it'll be a blowout. Um, I don't think the score will be what it has been in the past in some Georgia-Kentucky games where it's kind of gotten away from Kentucky. Um, but I just don't think Kentucky has the... the Look, I, it, Georgia's... It, I know run, Georgia's run game is or run defense is not as good as it was the last two years. There's no denying that. I still think a team has to have the ability to throw the ball to beat Georgia. I still think Georgia's defense, it's easy to say Georgia's defense is no good. Georgia's defense is good. Maybe it's not elite. Maybe it's not top five in the country like it has been each of the last couple of years. But Georgia's got a top 15-ish, top 20-ish defense. You can point out some stat you want that shows Georgia's 30th in this. I can find one that tells you they're ninth. I'm not talking about stats. I'm just talking about watch them play. They're one of the best 10 or 15 defenses in the country. That's just a fact. Um... So, yeah, I just, the the matchup for Kentucky, I just, I don't see it happening. I I just, I still feel like a team's going to have to have the ability to throw the ball. You just, I don't think you're going to be able to be as one-dimensional as Kentucky was last week and beat a team like Georgia, or as one-dimensional as Auburn was last week and beat a team like Georgia. I still feel like it's going to take a team um, that can spread Georgia out and throw the ball. And, um... I'm just not convinced Kentucky's going to be able to do that. So this is not a trash-talking video. Um, I respect Kentucky as a football team. Mark Stoops is one of my favorite coaches. He gets the absolute most out of the talent he's got available there. And, in, you know, now that we've got a transfer portal and he's able to dip into there, um, you know, Kentucky could remain a relevant team in the SEC for a while. I think Kentucky right now is probably the second. If you were to make, like, an SEC East pecking order, now this is the last year of divisions in the SEC, 
But if you look over the last, if you rank the last, let's say five years, if you were going to rank the last five years of the SEC East, Kentucky would be the second team on that list. Um, they haven't always finished second in the East, but they've been the most consistent, but other than Georgia, Kentucky's been the most consistently good team in the SEC East. You know, Florida has had several bad years in a row. Tennessee's only had one good year out of the last 15. Um, uh, South Carolina won eight or nine games last year, but, you know, before Beamer was struggling, you know, they were struggling. Kentucky's probably second in the pecking order right now in the SEC East. Again, that doesn't mean they're going to finish second every single year. Hell, they want to come in and beat Georgia and win the division. And I'm not telling you that's impossible. I'm, I'm not telling you they can't do that. I am picking against them. I'm, I'm going to take Georgia to win this game. But Kentucky's a legitimately good team. How good? Well, we'll find out more about that this Saturday when they come down to um, Athens at 7. Um, but I think this is going to be a good game. It's a night game. I think a lot of people will be watching this one. And let's be real. There are a lot of people lined up just waiting on Georgia to lose. And, um, you know, it's funny. Heading into the season... Um, Georgia wasn't going to lose to anybody. They're going to win every game by 100. This is the easiest schedule in the history of, of mankind that anyone's ever seen. Now, I knew as soon as I started reading those comments what was going to happen once the season started, and that's what's happening, which is every single week, my comment section is filled with people telling me we're going to lose. Then when Georgia wins, they tell me how bad the other team is. And, and, and it's just a rinse and repeat cycle. It's been going on here for three or four years on this channel. It's the same comments week in and week out, just a different, uh, just a different uh, year, you know. We, I mean, you got to remember, Georgia beat Oregon last year in week one, 49 to three. For two months, everyone told me Oregon was no good, and that win didn't mean anything. I mean, so it doesn't matter who Georgia plays and who they beat. The comments on this channel are going to be the same, you know. Monday through Friday, Georgia is losing. On Saturday, Georgia wins. And on Sunday, everyone shows up to tell me the team that we beat is no good and they can't believe I'm bragging about beating a bad team. After they spent the whole previous week telling me we're losing. They did it with Auburn. They're doing it again with Kentucky. They're going to do it with Florida. They're going to do it with Ole Miss. They're going to do it with Tennessee. It's the same thing every time. But I, I just don't think Kentucky is where they need to be, particularly um, with the passing game in order to come into Athens, which is a big deal. This game was in Kentucky. Boy, I'd be a lot more nervous. I'll be honest with you. I'd be a lot more nervous. Um, you know, I, I know Georgia stayed number one, I think in the AP and the coaches poll, I moved them down to eight. Um, I moved Georgia to eight. They, they clearly do not look like the best team in the country through the first month of the season. Now there's a, plenty of argument to be had about who is, there is no clear cut. Number one, I don't think is part of the problem. I've got Michigan one, Florida state two, Texas, Penn state and Ohio state rounding out the top five. Uh, and then I've got Washington, Oregon, Georgia, Southern Cal and, um, in, um, Oklahoma, and I think it's kind of a problem. But look, I mean, Georgia just hasn't been dominant. But we'll see what they do this weekend. They got to stop turning the ball over. Georgia does. They need to play better run defense. Um, I think the offensive line needs to play better, particularly in the run blocking. And the running back situation at Georgia, I mean, it, it's nice to think that that could improve over the course of the year. But the reality is for Georgia, the, um, the running backs just aren't nearly as talented as what Georgia's used to have. And it's just a fact. So, I don't know. I think I think Georgia needs to become more of a kind of a, you know how uh, a lot of teams will run to set up the pass. Georgia's been doing this forever. You know, run on first down, play action pass on second down. I, I'm starting to think it might need to be the opposite at Georgia. I mean, we might need to be throwing it on first down to set up the run. Uh, we're having a hard time running the ball. Part of it's offensive line, part of it's running back. But um, anyway, now I think guy Carson Beck's having a good year. Ninth in the country in passing yards. Carson Beck is with almost an 80% completion rate. So, so far, so good for Carson Beck. And I think that will continue this Saturday. Um, I think Georgia gets to win favored by 14 and a half. I wouldn't bet $1 on Georgia to cover a spread until they actually do it. Um, now, I don't bet against Georgia ever. Um, so I just, you know, I wouldn't bet on the game. Uh, but you do what you want. It's your money. They're favored by 14 and a half. I do, Georgia's going to cover a spread at some point. Look, if Georgia ever comes out and plays in the first quarter, which is something they haven't done all year, um, Georgia doesn't even start trying, it seems like, to the second quarter. But if they ever come out and actually play in the first quarter, don't turn the ball over, and don't miss field goals, eventually Georgia's going to cover a spread. Maybe it'll be this week against Kentucky. You know, maybe they win something like, uh, you know, I don't know, 31 to 14, uh, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, maybe So maybe they end up covering this 14 and a half, but I wouldn't bet a dollar on it until I see them do it. Anyway, that's it. Georgia versus Kentucky. Have a good morning.